you know, you know how to go down and all that, right? Uh, to her page. Hi, everyone. Welcome to this conversation with Manoj Kaimal. Uh, it gives me great pleasure to introduce uh, Manoj. He has been my uh, yoga teacher here in Malaysia for the last uh, 16, 17 years. I've lost count. And uh, let me just uh, read a formal uh, introduction about him before we get into the questions. So uh, Manoj Kaimal started yoga at a very young age, inspired by both his grandparents, who were dedicated yoga practitioners. And he adds, from their collection of books on philosophy that he was exposed to even as a young kid. He was formally trained from the Shivananda Yoga School and later learned under the Iyengar and the Ashtanga Vinyasa system. Manoj and his wife Sandhya founded the Manasi Yoga School in Malaysia in the year 2000. Apart from classes, he also conducts teacher training programs in Malaysia and Thailand, yoga retreats and workshops as well. He has contributed articles on yoga to leading dailies in Malaysia and is the author of two books, Celebration of Asana and Making Patanjali Palatable. And it is with great pride that I add, Manasa Yoga was awarded the best yoga school in Malaysia for 2020. Now, as a student of Manoj's for, like I said, the last uh, so many years, and uh, having him literally shape my uh, yoga path, what I really want to say is what makes uh, Manoj's classes unique is the manner in which he embeds philosophy into the asana practice. That really is something that is so beautiful and so interesting. So whether it is the koshas in Vedanta or it is the kleshas enumerated in the Patanjali Yoga Sutras, he makes you connect to it all by directing you towards it on the mat at an experiential level. So while holding an asana, we connect not just to the body at a gross level, but we also connect to prana, the energy. And we are also directed to connect to the mind, the manomaya, where we really look at the functions and the dysfunctions of the mind, the likes and dislikes, and all its various idiosyncrasies. And from there, we are also connected to the Vijnanamaya Kosha, where we learn to see all these vagaries of the mind. And yet, we are directed to choose to take that intellectual path and to try to stay with what is the right thing at the present moment, which is to stay with your body or your breath. And we're also directed to discern the play of the kleshas in our psyche. So is that raga or is that dvesha? Are we being pulled by compulsive attraction or aversion? Or is it abhinivesha, the fear of death, that drives our actions? And we end each class a little more conscious of ourselves, a little more awakened to our greater selves. And to use his favorite word these days, a little less entangled with the Nama Rupa, the names and forms of objects that we are constantly surrounded by. So with this, I welcome Manoj Kaimal this evening. Now the Thank stage you, is Shandra. all yours. So um, Thank you. I promise that I'm going to let him speak after this, after this uh, long introduction. So the first question is, um, can we talk a little bit about the mind-body-breath connection? Yep. Okay. Um, we can start on that. So when we talk about um, these English words, when we try to talk about it in um, the yoga language, um, everything gets expanded and split up and expanded. So each of these terms um, is a subject of inquiry and discovery. So when we say mind, body, and breath, we first start by looking at what exactly do we mean by mind? And uh, where is it? And, and then we can take a look at, okay, what has it got to do with body? So mind, um, in the yoga classification, 
mind actually is linked to a term called manas, which is very specific. But right now, when we are talking about mind, body, breath, maybe it's more general. So um, this whole thing, mind perhaps stands for information, emotion, and um, experience, and recognition. All these aspects uh, can be termed under mind. And um, this recognition on an individual basis, that alone, we can put it towards perhaps the brain. So at the brain, we, we recognize something. So you're looking at me and uh, based on what the reflected light through your eyes, uh, whatever is creating, you recognize a form. But beneath that, there is an infinite amount of exchange of information and that we are not consciously recognizing. But all of these things, this information, emotion, recognition, um, uh, emotion, all of that together can be put under this English term mind. Now, in the yoga understanding of the body, um, this information emotion exchange uh, takes place not only at the brain, but throughout the body. So in the yoga anatomy, we don't have just one brain. We have seven brains and they're called chakras. So we have uh, one um, brain at the pelvic area and each of these chakras is put up with uh, one um, awareness principle and then one energy principle. So it's like one which receives and processes information and then another which can act or not act based on the information. And there is emotions as well. So we have a, the different chakras at different locations. So just to give you the idea of now we are coming to the body part. So uh, this whole uh, information exchange, information itself creates this shape of the body. So whether we are talking about the DNA in the gene and RNA carrying out that protein distribution and creating up the shape. So it is information which creates the shape and that is the body. And um, when we talk about this mind body, so in yogic understanding, um, at the pelvis, um, those who are familiar, we have this term called Muladhara Chakra. And there you have this awareness principle. So we, we can say it's like mind and energy are there. So the terms are like, uh, the yogic terms are like Brahma and uh, Dakini, these two energies. And their locations, what they're looking at is from knee to feet. So from knee to feet, uh, this is the part which is receiving information and giving information and taking action. Similarly, from knees to hips is the Swadhisthana Chakra um, uh, concerns. So there, I think we have uh, Vishnu and Rakani. So we have the same things, which there is one processing, information processing center, and then there is this energy dynamism, which sends um, electricity and other actions into those areas. So this is how the mind body um, is in the yogic understanding, uh, that emotions are taking place everywhere. Information exchange is taking place everywhere and uh, every cell experiences. We might recognize only at uh, one place, but the entire body experiences. And I think here um, you got fascinated one time with what I was talking about, the correlate of all these, something that uh, scientifically, some terms which correlated with what we're talking about is peptide and receptors. Yeah. So, um, yeah, so that is when an information exchange takes place. Peptide carries information. And uh, when a receptor, which is specific to that peptide, allows that uh, information to enter the cell, the cell changes. So we have a lot of these peptides, um, neuropeptides along these seven chakra areas. Okay, so that is some um, one researcher who was also interested in the Eastern kind of studies. Uh, so she, her name is Candice Pert. So she um, came out with this kind of discovery, which was very fascinating. So at each of the chakra points, there's a lot of uh, neuropeptides and um, they really, so then in yogic understanding, okay, these peptides from Muladhara will go towards the legs uh, below the knee and receptors there will receive this. And when it receives the, the correct information, the electrical charge of the cell changes. So when the right information, when the right peptide enters the receptor of the right cell, 
the chemistry changes, the cell, the vibration changes. So mind body is just it just moves together. So mind, we are talking about this information, and then there's this information exchange, and that in the physiology we are talking about this peptide receptor bonding, where uh, the cell, the physicality of it really changes in terms of its chemistry, in terms of its electrical discharge. And likewise, our entire body, uh, all the cells, its charge can change. So this is in one way I'm trying to uh, link both our ancient teachings and modern, uh, some of the upcoming discoveries of the mind and body. So this is how we try to bring about a a change as well. So to, to, to change the body, we have to change information which is going into the cells. And uh, that is the process. Hope I kind of covered what you asked. Yeah, so to sum it up, basically, uh, if I can say it, I think your mind is just, uh, we all have this impression that the mind is only in the brain, but basically your mind is all over your body. Right. And that everything yes. that uh, you experience is actually experienced, uh, not just in the brain, like we imagine, but it's really experienced in every cell in our body throughout. Yes. Only the conscious recognition. Yeah. That that a, a limited kind of ex, ex, recognition happens uh, in uh, in the brain. Okay? But yeah. all cells um, connect. Yeah. So this is really something uh, very important that uh, which why it became my first question, because Right. Uh, most people uh, don't see that connection between the mind and the body. Right. It's always separate things. So it's important to know why the mind and the body and how deeply it's connected and to know that the mind is really, you know, all over your body and uh, to realize that because uh, to shine the light of awareness on our minds as well. Because when you think about health, we only think about the body. But, you know, to realize that it all begins in the mind and whatever we feel, all our emotions are so important because they're all reflected in every cell in our body. And ultimately, the yoga practice helps us to manage our emotions. And, you know, that is what, uh, you know, it's all about. And really all that I learned from you. Yeah. And uh, so to, uh, yeah, so that's really something that's fascinated me also, the way you correlate science and the yoga practice, because uh, I mean, it's very unfortunate. It's not like, uh, you know, these are all new concepts because they've always been there in yoga, but unfortunately, or fortunately, I don't know, but when it's backed by science and when you can understand it through the language of science, then you kind of, uh, you know, have a little bit more, uh, you know, or maybe it's just your ability to comprehend becomes better. So uh, it just makes it easier to understand it or grasp it. And yeah. there seems yeah, to be a validity we, to it. Yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah it has course. to be validated uh, for people to accept. And yeah. even while we are talking about all this, we also have to be, as yoga teachers, very humble in that we are not the actual scientists. So we are grateful yeah. for uh, these groups of people who are doing some kind of correlating uh, uh, research and all those things. So we humbly take whatever um, is coming out of it. And yeah. uh, the one thing with Western science, they might change also. So like the, the, some of the terms all might change, but it's nice to see that there's a clear correlation. And um, um, so, yeah, we, we share it. Yeah. Okay. So uh, we're just moving on to the next question. I mean, like uh, asana is really a big theme for you. Yeah. So in your classes, in your teachings, and I remember once having this conversation with you as well. And you told me that, you know, our medium is really the asana practice. So um, just like you to expand like for a lot of people asana is really like an exercise it's like you know you stretch and uh, it looks pretty much the same you can't blame people really because if you you know strike the same position you know two people do the same position it you know what's the difference between the exercise and you know it may it making it an asana right so just to shine some light on you know the expanded uh, version of asana okay so so asana, see, when, when we are looking at um, the meaning of anything, um, there has to be some knowledge in the first place. So because we are predisposed to, so if you simply look at an asana without uh, the knowledge of the context, uh, then yes, it definitely looks like a, a stretch. Uh, but if you spend some time in understanding the context in which this asana fits, so um, for example, um, uh, the term asana comes in most yoga texts, and the meaning of it actually changes from uh, text to text. So 
in uh, Padanjali's, um, I mean, that's one great teacher of yoga, Padanjali, and then there's uh, Shankaracharya. These are very famous, uh, great pioneer teachers. Um, so in their philosophy, uh, the body is actually an uh, obstacle towards uh, enlightenment. So we want to connect um, to the wisdom of what we are um, at our essence. And body is an obstacle. So in that sense, uh, they, the Dangelis the and uh, the practice seems to be we, we use the asana um, to dual purpose, to, to make that hip area all prepared so that it can eventually assist us in long sitting. So for long periods of pranayama, for long periods of uh, meditation, so it kind of assists in in that purpose. Also, um, when you are in those asanas, uh, Patanjali asks us to continuously be aware. And uh, if we get a break from the shape idea, uh, we might connect to the body as this mass of energy. Um, uh, and uh, those aspects of the body, we will connect to it. But Patanjali is very clear that we are not exactly that energy. We are uh, spiritual awareness. So the context slightly differs, uh, but the asana as we really do it, all the yoga studios which does asanas, they are actually basing it on uh, the great tantric texts. Um, and uh, based on tantra, we have texts such as Hatha Yoga Pradibhika, Garanda Samhita, um, Yajnavalkya Samhita. There are a few texts like that. They form the basis uh, for the asana practice as we see um, in the in in all the yoga studios now so there the context is um, the tantra have this um, vision where a form emerges but before it comes out it comes out as uh, a geometry so lines form dots dots two dots will be connected by line triangle forms triangle superimpose and slowly, slowly, a complex shape develops. So from that point of view, they have this called yantra. Yantra is this kind of uh, mandala, an energy field uh, with specific geometry. So these lines and uh, patterns kind of organize the, the limitless energy into specific function, into a specific expression. And that is what the body is. So Hadeyoga Pradibhika, we have chosen one particular verse as our theme verse for students to have that information first. Uh, that the crux of the practice is Shakti Madhya Manakritva, Shakti Manasa Madhyagam. So put your attention on energy, uh, not exactly the, the shape making other shapes. So how are we moving? Can we know more of what moves us uh, rather than how much can I move? So that context shift happens. And in that process, in that humility and in that spirit of inquiry, we might start to slowly connect to uh, that mysterious energy, which, which lets me talk right now. So the asana thing is, when you, when you really look at it, we really don't know how things are happening. So talking, I can just claim that I am talking, but the eye which says I am talking doesn't have a clue. So once I'm informed of that, I become a bit humble. And I'm just looking at it with some gratefulness. And then if I'm looking at it with some inquiry, then by the grace of this energy, I might start to get an inkling of it. So um, these are the contexts in which asana sits in our school, like this beautiful geometry of the universe by which each one of us emerge out. And um, when we, uh, each asana is also a geometry. So when we really focus on the lines and the patterns and all of that, we will start to hopefully connect a bit more and bit more to that, that essence geometry, the yantra that we are, to the mandala that we are, to the beautiful energy fields that each one of us are. So that is the context of asana. Yeah. So um, again, I have a question I can see in the comment section from Velayudan. Okay. So it's very similar to the question that I just asked, like yoga has become more like exercises through Western influence. So uh, can you just say a little bit about the difference between like, you know, an exercise and, you know, what makes it an asana? Like suppose triangle, right? Yeah. Somebody is doing like a lateral stretch. How does it, you know, 
some just some two three points about really what distinguishes yeah. it yes so um a stretch is like like say the shape of triangle pose so at our school we make this distinction we call it with the english name for the shape of the pose so triangle pose now when so that's a form of the pose when you start to add in the information and add in the inquiry that is when asana starts to evolve in that pose otherwise it's a pose we are posing uh, there is uh, nothing of asana in there for asana to rise there has to be certain ingredients put in uh, in terms of your concentration in terms of your direction so earlier we were saying that asana comes in the tantric text of hatha yoga and there at the start of the text the authors say that it is purely for uh, understanding our essence that every aspect of hatha yoga is given including asana okay so it is all given as tools for us to connect now if there is no information about this so what we say in our school is information shapes your attention attention shapes your um sorry information shapes intention intention shapes your attention attention shapes your action and action karma decides what you get out of it so um so in the first place teachers have to inform students very clearly that the distinction between asana and uh, posture okay so um, and and understand these basic concepts of this energy field which uh, every manifestation in the universe is including our body and it's got specific angles you know so everything like every joint uh, there are these beautiful angles and uh, and forms so um, once they once they're educated about that and clearly told that this practice is not just about improving flexibility but internally to to understand more um about the body understand more about you yourself then that process will start to move towards asana we can't simply do an asana we can do a pose we can do a stretch but all these um philosophical ingredients have to be put in uh, in the first place some information has to be there with that their intention should be let me feel what moves me with that intention their attention gets shaped they will try to feel uh, the subtler aspects of the movement otherwise their attention is just going to when will i touch my head to the knee or something like that so um so that is the process so then that mental intellectual um process accompanies the physical process then we have an asana uh, an asana starts to form um otherwise it is a posture and it is a stretch yeah so uh, i think again i learned this you have all these nice phrases so i think it's that uh, concept of from uh, shape to state right so yeah. uh, that is the whole uh, journey of asana right so actually it all begins so we're not saying that it's not a stretch right so it yeah, does begin it a with stretch. a stretch but we in our i always think it's our own ignorance right because like you say we're not educated right so in our own exactly. ignorance we limit it to a stretch it's only yes. that but if we have the knowledge if we have the right teachers then we realize that it begins with a stretch but it doesn't end there and you know it exactly. it uh, eventually will reflect in you know the state of your mind right it's a state yes so when when you just said state and shape so another aspect of it is, is okay everything in yoga is about learning about understanding so there is this uh, phenomena called state dependent learning so uh, roughly it is like our learning um so like for example um at the time of encoding an event so if i am um doing something and i'm i'm, I'm learning something at this point of time um and how my body is at this point of time um later if i put my body into that same kind of uh, position i will remember it and to make it more simple if you did something while you were drunk uh when you're not drunk you might not remember it but when you get drunk again you might remember it so that is state dependent learning so we go through a lot of states uh throughout the day so state what we mean is when you have one thought that's not a state 
when you have the similar type of thoughts continuing for a for some units of time that's when it becomes a state just a fleeting thought um i'm hopeless that won't bring about a state but if that i am hopeless continues for a week then a state of hopelessness develops okay so um this whole thing might be happening when you are in a particular uh, body posture because the body like we earlier said the cells get what you are thinking uh, through that information exchange through the peptides through the hormones they immediately get the information and their electrical current changes their uh, their state um, is very reflective of the mind state so the posture it starts to get into your posture your state and um, in that state if you remain in in that body shape uh, you are only going to learn more and more of your hopelessness uh, because it's state dependent learning in that state even if somebody else is coming and telling you hey you are the greatest person in the world this person will just hear it but it, it won't receive so the asana at that level in terms of a transformation we talk more, more about this shape dependent learning so uh, the state of the mind is reflected in the shape of the body uh, and the patterns um, and when we change that so when we do a great back bend and open the heart and we change the breath pattern it completely changes the state in which the only learning for the person was i'm a failure or i'm i'm scared or something that's the only thing that person was learning again and again relearning himself or herself then that changes into something perhaps there has been moments when the person felt very empowered and the body language was something like yes i did it something like this and then through the sequence you are taking them through all these shapes they suddenly remember okay because it's state dependent so uh, then new inputs can come in okay so they get a break from the other state which is shape dependent as well to so shape change you put them into great shapes and great breaths and heart opening abdomen opening um they can then suddenly remember their own greater moments and that can shift so in these ways too asana even if you're not talking about like understanding their energy reality and all that simply it can shift you from a, an unwholesome uh, state uh, where you learn yourself in an unwholesome way again and again because of the same pose uh, when you change that um, you will connect uh, to your own um, um, beautiful sides so that is also linked to asana yeah so i'm just seeing a lot of family and friends on the comment section which is why i'm looking there and smiling so uh, just hi to all of you and uh, thank you all for joining in and i truly hope that you are enjoying the discussion so to just uh, sum this up i mean it really goes back to the discussion that been, we've been having from the beginning of the session about how you know our mind and body is connected because i see my a uh, cousin prakash here who has also asked a question you know kindly explain mind body breath connection so it's really that everything is connected and uh, i always say you know yeah, when right we now, are uh, sorry the voice broke <clears throat> okay let me try again so uh, is it okay now yeah it's fine yeah so basically when we get angry we get agitated right so, so we talked about this how every emotion that we feel is really reflected in every cell in our body so the great thing about yoga practice is that the reverse also holds true right so like the mind has such a great influence on the body and the breath right similarly we actually in yoga class we do the reverse we use the body and we use the breath to bring about a more positive state of mind right so like i was telling somebody i mean all this i learned from manoj only in class he'll say uh, you know nobody can be like this and say i feel great right shoulders rounded chest rounded because your body really uh, we embody our minds yeah so our body is reflected so like you said when we change the shape of our body when we lift the heart when we you know expand through the rib cage when we ro roll the shoulders back when we do all those uh, you know we uplift the energy in the mind as well 
so uh, that's the connection yes. between mind body and breath and also you know our mind and our breath is also very deeply connected right when we get angry or agitated if you notice your breath it will be different when you're meditative or you're admiring the sunset if you look at your breathing pattern again that will be different so uh, like how the mind can influence the breath the breath also has the ability to do the reverse and influence the state of our mind as well yeah um, sorry i'm just uh, explaining in just a little yeah. simpler, simpler language <laughs> yes yeah so that's how uh, that's where pranayama practices come in where we um, like i heard you know it's not just breathing right because everybody breathes but uh, pranayama practice is really learning to consciously uh, regulate the breathing yeah so it's um, really working with a certain count uh, working with the retentions and uh, as we use the breath right it brings about a beautiful stable state of mind so that's the explaining to my uh, cousin's uh, question about how mind body breath is connected yeah so um, another student was asking me this is lakshmi whose question was uh, your from your book right so um, it's nice to know that people are reading the book this is the uh patanjali palatable the yoga sutras the first chapter so she has asked uh, about being in the now so she says uh, can you talk about the very first sutra about uh, atha yoga anushasanam and exactly how what does it mean in these times so this is a doubt from the very first sutra I'll also be happy if she, she asked me about the fifty-first sutra. No, no, but this she is said she that your book. The first no, sutra. no, ah, uh, she said that your book was very hard to comprehend. <laughs> oh gosh, okay. So, um, okay. yeah, so it was an opportunity to ask. Hi, Lakshmi. I hope you're here, okay. and I hope you're listening. <laughs> okay. So uh, the question was, uh, what do what do I mean by "ada"? Be in the yeah. now. Yeah. 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 In that first okay. verse, Atha Yoga Anushasana. Yes. Yeah. Okay, so that that's coming from that other term, and um, um, being the now. Um, to explain it, um, we we do not say that instruction in isolation, um, because though it sounds great, you know, we see a lot of um, social media posts and all that. Just just let go past, let go future, be in the now. But this now is very fleeting. It is continuous with the past and the present. There is no now without them also. So th th this needs a little bit of uh, thought. And and also, like it is not like uh, we can be anywhere else. We don't have a choice. So even if you're thinking of the past or the future, that thinking is happening in the now only. So we are always in the now. We don't have a say in that matter. Now, what... Um, I mean, when I say be in the now, is there is a specific capacity which you can um, uh, make effective only by being in the now. And that is the power of choice. So the power of choice, you have to be in the now because every moment unfolds as a choice of experiences, a choice of possibilities. You can think of that or this you can do this or that you can entertain or enlighten there's so many choices in 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 the moments and um, we might be pushed by what we have always done in the past so the past patterns tend to just push us through the present into the future and we are just uh, a rollover uh, from the past and um, then we don't have this we're not ex exercising this power of choice so it is in that context that we say be in the now and then look at uh, what this moment is bringing and um, can you look at it from the point of view of uh, um, your responsibility um, uh, your intentions um, and then choose a wise course of action we talk about yoga karma su kaushalam so yoga is um, undertaking your karmas with skillfulness and skillfulness is about choice and a choice we can't do if we are lost so generally we talk like future basically what we are talking about is like um, uh, afflictive patterns is what we are talking about so future there can be worry there can be fear of a scenario and that keeps coming up um, and then we don't have a choice in this moment so what can I do skillfully in this moment should be, that's where your power lies. 
or we can get lost in the future on that fear of a possible outcome or we can be lost in in a future enjoyment which is raga then now it's getting technical or in the past uh, we can get lost in guilt or uh, such kind of things and there is nothing wrong in being in the past or the future um, you can go to the past deliberately so i you can choose right now let me look at my past actions and see where i went wrong so that you're witnessing the past and trying to learn from it that is not a problem you you chose that what we are talking about you're not choosing you just just sucked into the past uh, that uh, we need to uh, fight and uh, liberate our capacity of attention and choice now towards that one of the tools is the body always kind of stays in the present so the mind can think of past and future you can always jump around but the body cannot vanish into past and vanish into future is always in this moment so every now and then simply become aware of your posture how the feet is touching floor how the butt is touching seat how the breath is that brings you into this discerning faculty into this attention then you get this power of choice which uh, technically we call it as vivega okay yeah so uh, it's also one of the first uh, like your manasa yoga one of the first principles where you talk about atha yes. right yes. so yes uh, what i also in simple ways i think uh, we also have to first realize right how disjointed our minds and bodies are so i have a kids yoga class and in simple terms when i tell them i just you know first to be conscious that we are always separated and the mind and body is always like you're at work and you're thinking about home you're at home you're thinking about work you're you know you're at work and you're thinking about this fantastic holiday that you would like to have and you're actually there on the beach and you're thinking about a deadline so first to see that dysfunction of the mind and to see how we're always uh, never really present to where we are and i think in yoga class we learn the tools right we use the body we use the breath and yes. we learn to be as we become more conscious of the mind we also realize right where are we right the yathamana that is again a question that you always uh, ask us to ask yes. ourselves right so yes. where is the mind yeah. and in that yeah. way we learn to become more conscious about our minds so where is our mind is our mind here is where is, our, is you know with who is the mind right and that's that whole process of uh, uh, being present using the body and the breath right which we learn yes. in yoga class yes Okay, so um, I have a, a question here from a cousin of mine from Singapore. A captivating discussion. Do you recommend yoga practice to people with uh, physical disabilities? Yeah, certainly. And um, we just have to look at the kind of disability. Yoga is suitable for all, um, but uh, the the most simple things we first look at is. biomechanical diseases so you have a back ache uh, your neck ache those kind of things uh, we have to take a look at it and we should not also simply simply believe that yoga is good for everything it really depends on the teacher so um, the teachers who have spent a lot of time studying mind and studying body and anatomy and and got good experience uh, then they will uh, come out with a sequence which will help the person who is suffering from a disease so uh, for biomechanical issues we have to really know the joints and the range of movement and we can analyze how the person with an issue moving and from there we can find out perhaps uh, what is lacking there we can strengthen the muscles or lengthen the muscles and we can work on it but disease can be you know, physiological neurological and all those things there also yoga is very useful uh, perhaps not so much on a movement perspective so if somebody is completely uh, bedridden uh, due to a stroke or something yoga is useful but perhaps not in its expansive movement but from its philosophy um, so giving the person uh, a different way to look at things and to bring cheer and uh, to give another direction and to connect to the pleasantness of that 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 essence within um so in that way so do we say yes yoga is good what aspect of yoga so that the skillful teacher um uh, should uh, discern and um, then yes yeah so i think it, this again goes back to expanding on you know what yoga is right like these days asana and yoga again are used very interchangeably 
right? So to yes. understand that uh, the the term yoga really encompasses so much more um, than just uh, the body as in like whenever we say yoga, we immediately think of a shape. Right, but to know breathing yeah. practices come into yoga practice, right? Attunement to your mind, observing your mind, all that is also part of the yoga practice, developing you know more yeah. consciousness, more sensitivity. So um, if we expand on that idea of yoga practice, then yes, it is applicable to I mean, I think as long as you can breathe, in, you can do situation. yoga practice, right? Yeah. So yeah. it's just that we tried, we tend to think of yoga as only something that like standing on your head or, you know, like really uh, twisted into a shape. So we think that yoga is just that, right? So which is why uh, we find it limiting if we can't do that. Like you yourself yeah. have I been mean, through yoga a is lot that, of, but yeah. there is more. Yeah, there is more. And you yourself have been through a lot of injuries, right? So uh, your wrist and all that, but you have kept yeah. your practice going in so many other yeah. ways, right? Yeah, exactly. Okay, so uh, how do how does yoga help to deal with anxiety, stress, fear in these current times? I think that's a big one for most people because that's yeah, what I mean. Are... Um, see. Current times, I mean, um, is all times. So Arjuna was uh, deeply in confusion and sorrow. So he asked Krishna as to what do I do? And uh, so um, so this is something which uh, we can say that uh, humankind haven't really um, figured out this anxiety, despair, uh, confusion, fear, and such things. We have uh, developed so much economically and in uh, communication and but this this basic questions, if you look at the text in 2000 years back, or, uh, they're asking the same things. And um, they came upon uh, a method by which they started to find uh, peace and uh, energy and all that. And that is yoga. So now when we talk about this right now, only thing is I can bring some, some terms into it. So anxiety, despair, and all of that, we can put to one response of our body and the mind um, when it interprets something as a threat, um, not as a challenge where it can then um, release its uh, energy uh, and all that. But if we really see it as a threat, which can take us down, so then that sets about a lot of activities. So we talk about um, this emotional center as the limbic system. So you have one structure called the amygdala, which is one of the chief uh, things of that system. When your mind um, gets a sense of threat, it immediately comes alive. And then that has connections to your pituitary gland and your um, adrenal glands and so forth. And it will start to then um, result in your body uh, getting a lot of cortisol. So your adrenal glands will start to then secrete a lot of cortisol and all your bloods are then um, carrying this to all the cells. So that is one way to go about it. Now, how do we counter that is um, what we talk about is to shift attention. Um, so shift attention, uh, we can't simply shift attention from fear to courage. Um, so when people are very angry, we all instinctively say, don't be angry, don't be angry. Or we keep saying, relax, relax. That only infuriates more. Okay, so we can't simply go opposite in that way. So um, what we have to do is, all this is based on this um, uh, exaggerating and the story creating centers of the brain. And what we need to do is activate centers of the brain, which will give you simple, neutral, direct sensations. So it's based on a simple idea that the the, the volume of blood in the brain is constant. So it's not like it can feed the, 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 the craziness structures as well as the calmness structures in the same way. So if you can shift blood from this amygdala and all of that, then your emotions of uh, anxiety, despair starts to go down in proportion to that. But we have to give the brain um, a reason to, to shift the blood flow. So for that, things such as, I mean, all of you know this, we say, okay, count your breath or count your uh, footsteps, or simply um, lift your arm up and down 25 times and just feeling that movement. So
So if you are trying to simply feel the foot, feel the arm, feel the movement, the parts of the brain which can give you that experience is totally different from the parts of the brain which is giving you this all these emotions. So if you stick with, I want to just feel my arm moving, if you stick with it at a, at a particular unit of time, which varies from person to person, uh, that blood will start to drain away from those structures and then you start to get a release. So every day we have to spend some time in these kind of activities. Um, so becoming aware of the body. Uh, so if you're just walking and uh, um, thinking of stressful things other than a physical exercise, it won't really cleanse um, uh, our stress generating activities of the brain mind. We have to really focus on seeing the sky, seeing the birds, uh, feeling the dew on the grass, and such kind of things to really have a shift of attention uh, from this kind of stress stimuli uh, to neutral, simple, direct sensations. So that's what every class attempts to do. So we emphasize that the teacher should not be silent throughout the class. It's not like put them in a pose, put the timer, and then just um, take them to the next pose. We need to talk for students to connect uh, to, to the sit bones or upper back or the right of the skull so that they keep on going into this. Otherwise, the emotional trauma incidents are more dramatic. The mind will just go, mind likes drama. You'll keep on revisiting those areas. So that's what I can, I can, I can tell you at this point. Okay, so I have a question here from my uh, very good friend Kavita from Coimbatore. Um, so she says her daughter is very flexible, but uh, feels pranayama and asanas are not her cup of tea. So how do you uh, instill interest of yoga in children? Um, children, um, okay, children is a little bit tricky. Um, so in the sense that one way to captivate them is if they get interested in the movements. Um, and um, otherwise, uh, they should, find for themselves that they are lacking in concentration. Okay, so uh, for me, that was very clear at a certain point of time, I'm not able to concentrate. Um, and uh, so that discernment, then then I, I had to work. So I started counting breath, I started to watch breath, and soon I found that my ability to hold attention on what I need to focus on is improving. So it starts to show in my exam results, and then once we sense some benefit coming out of it, we get interested. So um, you know, to, to such a person who is not inspired by anything physical, so whatever you show, she says, oh, I can do this, then they're not motivated by that. Um, but um, then perhaps we say that, okay, daily do um, count 50 breaths and then take 10 deep even breaths and then see how, you know, by, by you will understand uh, uh, chemistry a bit more and then they are, if they are willing to give it a try. So we can approach it from different ways and we don't have to force yoga on anyone also. Uh, it'll come on its own at a certain point of time when they're looking for answers, when what they're getting uh, is not enough and they, they feel that urge, uh, then only we need to give the teachings. For one big example of this timing is the Bhagavad Gita itself. Krishna was with the Pandavas all the time. Uh, 14 years or I uh, forgot the number of years in the forest, they would have been very near some beautiful rivers, beautiful locales to give a philosophical discourse. Krishna never said. He never put anything into Arjuna's mind. It's finally when Arjuna threw away the Gandivam and said, I don't know what to do. Uh, Krishna, you tell me. Okay, I am lost. Okay, I am this big hero, but right now I'm a zero. I don't know. That dispassion, that's the time when Krishna gave the teachings. So we do not have to rush. Let them play, let them do stuff. Yeah, so um, this is my good friend, uh, Sandal's daughter. The question is about. Okay, yeah, yeah nice. Yeah, I know Sandal, yeah. Yeah, so I think it's really great that uh, you have already exposed her. I think exposure is good and at the when, the, when they need it, right? When the time comes and if they need it, exactly. everybody have different paths and it's not that everybody has to go into the yoga path either. So yes. if they the child, need it, they know that there is a such, such an option. Exactly, available. exactly. The child is listening. They, they are understanding all these things. So at a later point of time, when they come to a juncture where they need more wisdom, they need to connect, they want to calm their mind, they know what to 
uh, look for. Yeah, at they least they know that there is such an option. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. So then, uh, going back to another question here. Uh, so um, people say that yoga is an ancient spiritual practice. People also say that yoga is a health and fitness system. Can you share your perspective? Um, see, it's it's both. So, um, for example, like this is about people finding meaning, right? Uh, what it means to them. Yeah. For some people, it's this great tradition and which can, which can connect you to your essence and the others, yeah, it's something I can do in my gym. So it is very much like uh, uh, if you know of Hanuman stories or, or I will leave Hanuman out. Uh, so if you just No, I think you should sun, talk about the Hanuman. <laughs> okay. So, I mean, there's a Hanuman in all of us. So as a child, yeah. when we look out and see this beautiful um, orange or red um, ball-like thing there, um, an idea of the sun might come. You know, for Hanuman, it was this juicy fruit there which he wanted to eat. Um, and uh, for somebody else, like kids now, they might ask their parents, as to what is that? And they might say something, it's a sun. So, um, so that is the meaning. So a person who, look, who comes to the gym and see a yoga teacher, they are doing some stretching. And for them to look at, hey, what is that? And that's stretching, that's yoga. So that's that, that child mentality. You know, you see something, you immediately, you know, quickly, some meaning they might ask somebody else also but um, that's what they start off with you know? so later as the child grows perhaps the child maintains a curiosity with the sun in Hanuman's case he maintained that curiosity with the sun so he started to see that when sun comes up in the morning everything comes up um, flowers bloom um, the whole um, world wakes up with the sun and he understood that sun is not just illumining stuff. The sun is giving them something. Uh, the sun is enlivening. Sun, sun, uh, there is some information in the sun's light. And then in his journey, he finally makes sun his teacher. So to uh, tell you um, of what we are talking of now, so yoga is like that. You start off by seeing it as a stretch. And then as you continue, like again, coming back to the sun example, the more you learn of the sun, uh, you understand that this, this is exploding, I don't know, nuclear fusion or fission, I don't know, but it's an exploding thing, it's a process. And finally, you might realize that you are the sun itself, um, that you might read that Earth broke off uh, sun or whatever you eat, carbohydrates is basically sun. The sun is what uh, enters the plants and photosynthesis, and finally, you're eating sun. Hanuman got his wish in that way. So whatever, when we eat carbs, it is like, we are ingesting sun and we are not separate from sun. So that direction takes place in yoga too. Starting, I got a backache, I do these stretches. But as you move along, uh, you start to understand that yoga is actually about you. Understanding yoga uh, is understanding you. So then we start to connect to this whole ancient spiritual tradition. But starting, yeah, like the... Hanuman wants a son. Yeah, I want that post. I want to do it and make it my profile picture. So that yeah. kind of thing. So I guess different people just enter the practice for different reasons. Yeah, for some it's yes. like back. You want yeah. a strong back. For some yeah. people, maybe it's some other health issue, right? So, but ultimately yeah. we stick yeah. with the practice, then it all takes us back with the yes. teachings. Yeah. So um, this is again from my good friend, Mini. So uh, she's uh, sent a question here. So they say uh, meditation is pure awareness, uh, not the mind, body or spirit, but yoga asanas are for strengthening body and mind. Isn't there a contradiction? Can you explain this conundrum? Um, so can I just read that again? Really slowly? Yeah, so basically uh, yoga asanas, uh, it's said here, are uh, for strengthening body and mind, right? But uh, people say mm -hmm. meditation is pure awareness. So how can meditation and yoga be two sides of the same coin? Okay, so now meditation, the Sanskrit word is dhyanam. D stands for awareness and ayanam stands for movement. So like ramayanam, uh, narayana. So it is the nara, nara, ayanam, it's a journey of the person. Ramayanam is a journey of Rama. Similarly, dhyanam is a journey of uh, attention. Meditation is not uh, 
pure awareness. So that we are looking more at Samadhi. Meditation starts with withdrawing your attention from distractions. And that is where it starts. So our attention, gaining some control over attention, attention is always going after distractions, to pull it back. That is the starting of the yoga process of this word meditation. Dhyanam starts with Pratyahara. So that, where do you, you can't simply pull attention from something. You have to place it on something. It's called Pradishta. Where do you pull it? So in asana, we pull everything into body. Okay, so into that shape, into the details of the shape. So I can think of my worries of the future, guilt of the past, but from there all I pull it into feeling my big toe, into feeling my chest and all of that. It's a Pratyahara. Then we need to stabilize the attention. We have pulled back, but now we have to um, really hold it stable on a chosen object. It's called Desha Bandha Chittasya Dharana. That is a concentration. So you have to choose a singular field. So even asana can be a beautiful dharana field, which um, let's say you can even be moving. So sun salutes or let's say one Paschimottan asana. You draw your attention into this field. So just this field, this body and the breath, you just stay with that, your concentration is increasing. Okay, so that is the second stage. So there will be a lot of effort from your side initially to keep the attention on the chosen field because all the other things are continuously pulling you and you're trying to come back to the body. Uh, and eventually you find that you don't need to put so much effort on the attention the attention stays effortlessly on the object. It's not going anywhere. It's like um, uh, oil um, uh, being poured. And once it's going down, there is uh, no more effort. Like that, attention keeps flowing into the object. That, that state is meditation. That effortless flow of attention into the chosen object. Because there is no stillness. Because nothing is still. Moment to moment, time is flowing. So attention, each moment comes with its own possibility of experience. So our attention has to keep flowing from moment to moment to moment. Now, when the attention starts to gain a certain power, it generates what we call a penetrative ability. So it penetrates through the superficial knowledge, penetrates through the name word meaning, and it starts to get absorbed into the essence of whatever object that's when this samadhi starts to take place so samadhi can be first of an object but then later you understand that you're experiencing this object in the depths of your own consciousness that's where what many said this pure awareness only that situation happens so that is called nirbija samadhi there is nothing but only pure awareness so that's a progress so a process um so Meditation can be on any object, it can be the shape, it can be a sound mantra, it can be the breath, but this is the process. We draw, attend, gather strength, penetrate, absorb. Okay. So um, we're almost uh, running out of time. There's a question from Chandran here. Uh, can you please comment on the disparity as well as the common ground in the approaches of yoga and Vedanta? Um, so, I'm talking about yoga as of today, okay, so, and especially um, yoga as on the mat. So, here, especially in the way I teach at Manasa, we, we collect the wisdom from the different wisdom traditions of India, which is mainly the Sutra wisdom, the Vedantic wisdom, and the Tantric wisdom. We collect all of that and uh, try to teach and apply uh, in our practice. Everything serves. It gives us insights about ourselves um, in different ways. So when we talk about uh, the models, so we want to connect deeply, but then we need to have some models and templates through which we can immerse into ourselves. So the Sutra tradition gives us this 24 Tattva Pragrati model. Um, and uh, the Vedanta gives us this three Sharira, five Kosha model. So that all we find it extremely useful. And many of Shankaracharya's teachings where he says, 
meaning anything which can be known as mine is not I. So when you are staying in an asana, you are saying, okay, my foot. So if that foot is mine, then foot is not I. So my body uh, is so tight. When we say like that, then immediately we can say, uh, if it's anything is mine, if, it's, if the body is mine, then it is not I. Just like if this cloth is mine, it is not I. So in all these ways, we really um, use the teachings of Vedanta to connect to our own essence. But in an original context, um, Shankaracharya nor Padanjali was advocating a lot of time on asanas. For them, body is inert, jada, you as a distraction, uh, it creates lust and all those things. So you need to pull away from that body and connect to just pure awareness, uh, which is not the way Tantra goes, where the asana sits. So we are actually collecting and uh, uh, getting all these systems to to, to help us uh, because for us asana is the medium and um, and um, in that way we have created a parity but a strict Vedanta and especially luckily those uh, people of that tribe are not so much now they simply ridicule the asana practitioners and um, all kinds of nonsense such as uh, they will uh, classify the branches of yoga so they'll say if you're emotionally oriented go to bhakti yoga if you're intellectually oriented go to jnana yoga if you are uh, service-minded, do karma yoga. If you are a dumb wit and you don't feel emotion, you, you don't have any intellect, you don't have any service mentality, then at least go and stretch for a while, do some other <laughs> yoga. So that, that, that is the kind of propaganda from the maid. And so, but that's not true. I've um, heard that so, also. <laughs> yeah, so uh, what to do, I mean, uh, and, and, um, um, and then sometimes yoga teachers are not invested in education. They just learn up some sequences and start to teach. So then they, their, their dialogue, their conversation um, doesn't match up. You know, it looks like I'm stretching. What else are you doing? And they say, no, I just do stretching and Kundalini will wake up. That doesn't sound convincing at all. So um, with uh, integration of all this knowledge, we create parity. We look for it, there is disparity, but we create parity. We use all these great teachers and their wisdom to support our practice. And through the Hatha Yoga, we are continuously, we are also Jnana Yogis. We can't uh, split up like that. We have a brain, we have an intellect. We are learning all the time. Okay, so that's Jnana Yoga. And when we are connecting to the body, we will understand that there is something larger within us, which is making me talk, which is making me breathe. So I am devotional to that principle. I'm grateful to that principle. That's Bhakti Yoga. And I'm aware, I'm, I'm aware of my movements. And uh, I, as much as possible, try to connect to what's called the yajna buddhi. May what I do be of benefit to others too. I try to undertake actions like that. Then that is karma yoga. So you'll find that uh, though you're on the mat, doesn't mean you're disconnected from the other branches. So we, at our school, we integrate the different branches, integrate the different um, wisdom traditions as well. We create parity. Okay, I think we're almost... Uh over the time so I uh, just want to thank you so much but uh, before we close um, I just like you to just talk a little bit about your classes so you're having uh, online zoom classes going on so uh, just a little bit about that and how can people contact you right if somebody wants to get in touch with you maybe you can provide your email address or something like that at the end yes so uh, I, I, I teach in Malaysia at a studio but due to this uh, corona COVID situation I'm teaching uh, Monday to Friday via Zoom. So we have two classes, one in the morning for uh, people with some practice already, and in the evening, um, 7.15 uh, Malaysia time, uh, to people who are new to this, who wants to um, experience our way of uh, teaching and practicing yoga. So to know this, you can just, um, um, if Does you have- Does your website have, have the details? Of, yeah, yeah, website has the details or, uh, is this FP Live? If you can see me, you can FP message me. I can send you the class links and all of those details will be there. And uh, we can take it up from there. Otherwise, just search Manasa Yoga. Um, it, it, it should take you somewhere where from where you can start to get more information. Okay, I'll try and figure out a way to put, put in your details also. Yeah. So uh, thank you so much for your time. And oh, pleasure, uh, it's been God. a yeah. very uh, valuable uh, interaction. And uh, well, what can I say? I'll see you in class. Namaste. Okay. Thank you very much, Raja. And thanks to all the listeners for joining and listening and for your questions as well. Namaste.